good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Wing Wing, and I'm a tech lead on the Compute Infra team at Yelp. Um, Compute Infra works with a bunch of different technologies. Basically, we do whatever it takes to help developers deploy their code quickly and then run it reliably. Um, so in fact, our team is more well known as the container team at Yelp, so you can talk about that with me afterwards. But today, I'm here to talk about configuration because that doesn't get as much attention, and I think that it's also very impactful for our developers. Um, so for configuration, we really wanted to build a system that enables them to make changes really quickly um, while also making it easy for them to recover when inevitably some mistake happens and they need to uh, roll back. So today I'm going to show you how we put together a bunch of different components to make a system that I think has a really quite nice user experience and hopefully inspire you to build something similar in your own organization. Cool. So configuration can refer to a lot of different things, but today I'm specifically talking about application configuration. So values that are used internally in applications that you want to put in configuration because you want to be able to change them over time. So a classic example is like resource names in your application. If you're reading from an S3 bucket or a log, you probably want to be able to change that without having to redeploy your application. Some other examples, like maybe you want to be able to change the number of retries that you make or the time that you take in between those retries, or maybe just change the number of search requests or search results that you return without having to redeploy. I also want to mention that it's a really powerful tool for experimentation. Um, if you're going to be able, if you're going to be changing the percentages that are assigned to different groups in an experiment, then having configuration is a really essential tool to be able to do that quickly. Anyway, I'm sure that all of you are using configuration in some way in your uh, work, so I want to start by going through a, different, a few different ways that you can implement this in your application. The first baseline, I would say, is defining all of your uh, configuration values in a single module in your code, and then importing all of those values wherever you need them. So the pro of this is that it's a little bit easier to change these values when you need to. You don't have to hunt down every place you use that S3 bucket. You can just change it in one file. Um, but you're not getting anything in terms of speed because the values are built into your code base. Um, you still need to rebuild and redeploy every time you're changing one of these values. And you can't vary the values across environments. Um, again, back to that S3 bucket example, you probably have a different one in production versus dev. Um, and if you put this into your code, then um, you just have to either uh, deploy different versions or of your code or do something else. Um, so let's say we don't want to put the values into the code base itself. Um, a pretty common solution is to use environment variables. So here um, you can see that we're getting the timeout seconds from the environment and then using that in our request. So this way we can vary the values across environments by just changing the way that we're starting the process. This is a solution that a lot of people do end up using, but we didn't want to stop here because there was one big con for us, which was that you still have to restart the process to be able to give it a new configuration value. Um, and when a service takes some time to warm up or you have hundreds of um, developers trying to make changes to the same service, then that becomes kind of untenable. So we uh, wanted to keep going and try to find a way where you can change those values without restarting the process. And for us, that solution was uh, putting the configuration values into files. So when you're loading the configuration value from a file, then in the application code, you can check if the file has changed, um, let's say using the mtime or the md5sum, depending on how exact you want to be. Um, then you can just immediately get the new configuration value as soon as the file is changed. Um, so no surprise, this solution fits all of the criteria that I defined, and this is what um, we decided to go with. Uh, once we get there, uh, we know that we want applications to be loading configuration values from files. Then the next question is how um, developers are going to be making changes there and how they get onto all our servers. 
Luckily, there's a system that developers are already very familiar with um, for making changes to files, and that is Git. So our source of truth for all of the configuration for all of our services is a uh, Git repo on our like, serve configs master server. To make a change then, all a developer has to do is push a branch to master. Um, you'll notice in this slide that there's one uh, special thing. So the branch that I'm pushing starts with I and then has my username and some information about the change. Um, so that's a small optimization so that you don't have to have the um, most up-to-date master locally to be able to push to the remote. Um, there's a Git hook on the server where as long as your branch starts with I and there's no merge conflicts with master, then you push your branch and then we merge into master for you. Okay, and then from there, we we're really just using rsync to copy all the files from the Git master to our production web servers. And the thing to note here is that um, we have a tiered rsync system so that we don't have thousands of requests to the Git master itself. We have replicas that handle that load. One other thing I wanted to mention, I said that it's really important to be able to vary your configuration across different environments, so I'm gonna to touch on how we do that. Um, in the serve configs uh, repo, we store values in a, like, by location, sort of inspired by the high-risk system of puppets, so there are different types of locations. Common applies to every server. Um, then ecosystem is another type of location, and then they get more specific region, and so on. Um, so, um, the configs are stored this way in Git, and then when clients copy the files, then they perform one final step, which is to take the configuration that applies to their location and merge them in a system that we call higher merging. So here's an example. Let's say this server is in the prod ecosystem in the US West One region, and um, it's materializing the foo namespace. So, um, Common applies to everyone, and there's a foo file there, so we're gonna take that. And then there's a more specific file that also applies, which is in the prod ecosystem. And let's say there just isn't a file defined for the US West one region, so we can ignore that. Um, and so this is the final file that the applications are gonna load on this server. So we find this really useful because um, you don't have to repeat yourself as much when you're defining configuration for different locations. Awesome, so if we go back to um, that developer thinking about the fact that they need to make a change, um, from there, all they have to do is uh, you know, make the change to a file, um, get it reviewed as necessary, and then push the branch to master. Then we'll rsync all of the files, and then applications will notice the change in the file and then immediately start reflecting that new value. Okay, so let's pause and just Think about how that makes you feel. Um, it's pretty awesome because, uh, you know, considering that deploying code um, takes several times longer than that, and um, not to mention like the time to build and test before you do a deploy, you can see why the, this tool is so popular with developers, and they're always trying to think of new ways to use configuration instead of writing code. Um, but you might also be a little bit fearful for good reason because we are making changes to production really, really quickly. Um, and you may think that configuration is just values and kind of harmless, but um, it definitely can cause some pretty serious incidents. So I want to go through one example where um, one configuration change brought down the business information page on Yelp, which is basically our most common page, for about 15 minutes. And it all started with an experiment. So we were uh, doing an experiment about the layout and color of the buttons on our business information page. And um, so the YAML for that experiment might look like something like this. The experiment is called buttons. Um, there's a key that says whether it's active or not, and then a key that contains information about the cohorts and um, what percentages are assigned to each cohort. In the code then, um, for each request, you have a function that tells you what cohort you should be in for each experiment, um, and there's a lot of different ones, and the logic for this experiment said that you should use blue buttons if the word blue was in the name of your cohort. Okay, so this all worked 
really well. We gathered the data we needed about buns. Um, but then at the end, after we were wrapping up our experiment, we changed one thing, which was to make the uh, experiment inactive, and that brought down the site. Uh, I highlighted the problematic code here. It turns out when an experiment becomes inactive, um, get cohort starts returning none because um, there just aren't any cohorts for that experiment anymore, and the code that the developer wrote for this experiment didn't handle that case. So we started raising type errors everywhere uh, for 15 minutes. Um, this is maybe the most dramatic uh, example that we had recently, um, but it's definitely not the only one. Every year we do an analysis of the major incidents that affect the site to see how we can do better. And last year we found that serve configs changes were causing the same number of major incidents as code changes themselves. Um, so we realized that we needed to put more attention into the deploy process and make sure that was safe for developers as well. It's true that in the previous example, we could have done more with type checking to catch that um, problem, but you know, that code base has been around for a really long time and it doesn't have type checking. And really inevitably, um, no matter how much pre-testing you do, there's gonna be a a uh, way for a bad change to get through, and so we wanted to make sure that when that happens, there's a way that is really easy for developers to recover. Um, so this is what we came up with. Looks pretty similar to what I had before, um, because we really did want to keep the workflow as easy as it was before. Um, there's one difference here, which is the words printed by the Git hook when it um, Complete. So instead of saying merge to master, now it says deploy started. So we realized that you know, people were making configuration changes and like thinking that was the end of it, just walking away, or um, even if they you know, realized something went wrong, um, they didn't have any way to like, um, use the same interface that they were using before for making the deploy to like, take it back. Um, so we just wanted to start a more interactive process here to guide them and make sure that they were following best practices. So in other words, making it really easy for them to do the right thing in the few minutes after their deploy. Um, that meant automatically staging changes so that um, it goes first to staging and then to canary in production and then production um, so that developers have more of a chance to catch issues um, as the deploy is going through. And then once they do that, uh, providing a really easy way for them to roll back in one step so there's no question about how to recover as soon as you start seeing that uh, change is causing issues. Here is a preview of what that deploy process looks like. So once you push a branch now, you get a notification um, and you can see that the change is being gradually um, deployed to different environments and at the end it gets merged into master. Um, we're using Slack for this just because our developers are already on Slack all the time. But if you're not using Slack, you can definitely do this with another platform like the web or IRC, whatever. The important thing is that it's something that your developers are looking at. Um, so key features here, again, we have the staged deployments. Um, there's a really big button to be able to roll back. And we can add more details in the thread um, if we have more information that we want to tell them about their deploy. Okay, so now we have the slick UI, all we have to do is make it happen. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, and for that, I'm gonna just use an example where a developer is changing one namespace and one key, but it does generalize to multiple namespaces. Um, okay, so to implement a stage deployment, we basically need to create two new concepts. So we need the concept of a deployment version versus the normal version and then some way to uh, choose between the two different things. So when an integration branch is pushed, instead of merging it into master immediately, the Git hook will um, generate a deployment version of each affected file, which is essentially just what the file would look like if that branch were merged into master. And then um, we update a central control file that contains information about the rollout for each branch. So here's what that looks like. Um, we have the main file on the left, which is what is in master. The deploy file is the same um, 
but it has that diff that we uh, saw earlier applied to it. And then um, here's that control file. It's really called branches.json. Um, so when you push the um, branch, it starts out in staging, and then we can update this file as the deploy goes on. OK, and then once we have these files, uh, we just need to make the application understand them. Um, before, we had direct references to the names of the config files. So there wasn't a lot of space for us to be able to consider different deployments. Um, so what we did was pretty simple. We kept the API essentially the same, but we abstracted away the concept of files into namespaces. So when a deploy isn't going on, a namespace directly translates to the name of the configuration file. But because there's no file name, um, this gives us room to consider the new deploy files that we just created when we're reloading. OK, and then to roll back, all you have to do um, is delete the deploy files, remove the branch from branches.json, and applications will see that change and stop using the new values. Cool, so now if we look back at the deployment process, you can see how all of this is working. Um, there's just a uh, process that is started off by the Git hook that gradually updates the branches file, and um, then applications pick it up with the new client lib. Once you have developers used to looking at this interface for um, deploys, you can do even more and grad add more features over time. Uh, we like this uh, notification system so much that we wrote a library for it, and we're using the same thing for all of our code deploys as well. So when someone pushes a service, they'll get a notification like this. Um, they'll get notified when it goes to Canary and other things like that. Um, and there's also a similar capability to roll back. Um, here's an example of another thing that you can add once you have this type of interface. Um, so even after the deploy is over, um, you might want to roll back. And usually, you'd have to like hunt through the docs and figure out what the right command is. But here, we can just tell them exactly what the command is to roll back this particular change. So if you realize there's an issue, you can just copy and paste. Um, and then you can do more sophisticated things as well. Um, for our code deploys, we've started monitoring uh, the SLOs for the service that it affects. Um, so if the deploy starts, um, if an SLO starts failing during a deploy, that's a pretty good sign that the developer should take some action. Um, so this interface allows us to tell them about like, what started failing and what's going to happen. Um, so once we're confident in uh, how these SLOs are working, we can even automatically roll back based on them. OK, so you may be thinking, uh, this is cool, but why are we still using files? This seems like a pretty uh, low-tech solution. Um, and we kind of thought the same thing when we started thinking about how to update our system to add the new safety features that we were talking about. Um, for one, there are databases out there like Zookeeper or etcd that are sort of designed for storing configurations. So clients can watch, or watch for changes to specific keys that they're interested in rather than having to rsync every file every time. Um, and it turns out computers aren't very good at making automated changes to like inconsistently formatted files, but they are good at making API requests. Um, so having a data store would make it easier for automated systems to be able to make changes. Um, for example, um, we could use an API for updating the deploy progress instead of that central branches.json file. And we might be able to build on top of that API uh, with other systems that also want to update configuration. But as we started building out that database-backed system, we started realizing um, that files already had a lot of great features that we would have to re-implement. Um, as I said before, um, developers are really used to working with files, so they have a lot of good existing workflows. Um, if we were going to use a database as a source of truth, then we'd have to build a UI for them to be able to edit values, right? Um, whereas people already have um, nice text editors for being able to change many values at once. Um, and then we also have systems for searching 
the code and reviewing it, and we can reuse all of that for code files, and we'd have to redo something if we wanted to use a database. And then Git is also a really powerful tool for version control. Um, you sort of take it for granted that you can see all of the changes that have happened to a particular line or a particular file, or be able to roll back all of the changes that happened at one time instead of just rolling back a particular key. Um, and these features just didn't really exist for um, the databases that we were looking at. Finally, even though it seems inefficient, um, it's very operationally simple to run our rsync system, um, and it's easy to scale. You just have to add more replicas. And if the Git master goes down, it's super resilient to that um, because all of the configuration is just files on disk. In the end, um, the thing, again, that we care most about is the impact on developers. And we realized that we could add the features that we cared about for deploys, namely the automatic um, staging and easy rolling back without having to switch to a database. And so um, once we realized that, uh, we sort of changed course and went with that approach because um, we, yeah, we just wanted to build those features as quickly as possible. Um, I know that there are some systems out there that are really cool that um, do a hybrid approach where you might be making changes to files, but then there's like a git tailor that tails those changes and then puts them into a database for servers to use. Um, but honestly, we haven't run into any scaling issues with our system so far, and we're really happy with files. In the future, if we do end up getting to that scale where we need something like that, um, the new client lib, luckily, has, will give us that ability because we've abstracted away files now. We could be loading namespaces from anywhere. Um, so we do have room for that in the future, but we just don't need that right now. OK, so if there is one thing that I want you to take away from this, it's that configuration can be as powerful as code in both good and bad ways. Um, and you can make a really big impact on engineering productivity by having a good configuration system. At Yelp, we've done this by making it really fast and easy to update live configuration by dynamically loading configuration from files and then adding a interactive deploy interface um, to give uh, developers more feedback about the deploys that they're doing and gives them an easy way to recover if they need to. Um, I hope that this has given you some inspiration for uh, the future of configuration at your own company, and now I am happy to take questions. Thank you so much for that. Uh, as a reminder, if you want to ask a question, please line up at the microphone there. And remember to keep your questions short and brief. Thanks. Hi. So you mentioned at the very beginning that you know config changes out in two minutes. Yay. Um, and then, of course, that caused some problems. And then you've added a bunch of additional check work so now that you can push a change, but now that there's, there's some processing that has to happen, testing before it actually ends up, which is good. But I imagine that that slows down the amount of time it takes before your change actually ends up there. Had, did you find that the developers kind of revolted against that after having something super fast, and then now they had something that presumably was a lot slower? Um, so the initial change to the first environment, staging still happens within two minutes. Um, so. I don't think that the experience has gotten too much worse. And um, we are thinking about, in the future, adding buttons like fast forward this deploy to the Slack interface. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and now I'm really jealous that you have a rollback button on your Slack interface. <laughs> I think we need to build that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lee. Yeah.